The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. Um, I wanted to thank you guys all for coming out. It's a fantastic event, This, the Executive Leadership Series is, and uh, um, I wanted to welcome everybody here to, on behalf of the Walt Disney Company, and I'm Andy Kubitz, by the way. I'm the Executive Vice President of Programming and Scheduling at the ABC Network. Um, you know, I'm also a graduate, and I graduated PKE 125 from the Grazidio School of Business. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it, it's funny, I only graduated a year and a half ago, but since then, because of Pepperdine, I, I think uh, it helped me move over from CBS to ABC, so, uh, you know, tuition's paying off already. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm honored today to introduce uh, the Dean of the Business School. Um, you know, it's one of the largest business schools west of Chicago. And uh, Linda, you know, when she first became dean, she's one of the few female deans of a business school. And um, it's uh, a great thing for girl power. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'd like to welcome you all here and Linda Livingstone. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Andy. It's uh, always a treat to have one of our alums uh, here at a place where we're being hosted and, and uh, appreciate so much Andy doing that. And we may have to have you do an ad for us, Andy, if you'll keep saying those really good things about your experience at Pepperdine. But we certainly do want to thank uh, Disney and ABC for hosting us here. It's a treat. We do many of our Dean's Executive Leadership Series on our campuses. But when we get to go to the company where our speaker is from, that's a particular treat. And Steve Milovich is not able to be here but he also helped us arrange this. Steve uh, is uh, Vice President for Human Resources for Disney and he's on our Board of Visitors and he's a tremendous resource for us in placing a lot of folks here in internships and full-time positions so it is a real treat to be on the campus and to be here and we're so glad that all of you were able to join us tonight. What I would like to do is do just a brief update, as I always do on these, before we get to our speaker tonight. Uh, so you know some of the things that are going on uh, at the business school at Pepperdine. Of course, we are thrilled to be here for our second Dean's Executive Leadership Series. We hosted Bernard Kinsey in Malibu about a month ago, and that was a wonderful event. We had a great time. Yes, I see people here that were there, and he was uh, wonderful. He was an alum, which is also a treat. Um, we do, you have in your seat uh, information about the upcoming events in the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. So we take a break over the holidays and we come back on January 10th with Ed Wedbush. So if you're in the finance world or know someone that is, he's obviously kind of an icon in Los Angeles as an entrepreneur and uh, with Wedbush Securities. And then in February, we're doing an interesting partnership. Um, Beta Gamma Sigma, or do we have any Beta Gamma Sigma members in our audience? Yes, that means you are really smart because Beta Gamma Sigma is our honorary society in business for our best and brightest students, so high GPA students who did exceptionally well. And it's an international organization. They're celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. And as part of that, they're doing a speaker series around the country and around the world. And so we are co-hosting with them uh, the event on February 19th with Gary Burnison, who's the CEO of Corn Ferry. And that is the exact day that Beta Gamma Sigma was founded 100 years ago. So it's kind of a treat for us to get to host that. And the focus of that series is around values and ethics. And so we felt like that was a great fit with us. It fit perfectly with our Dean's Executive Leadership Series. Uh, so we're going to not only be hosting our folks for that, but we're also hosting others around Los Angeles that are a part of Beta Gamma Sigma. So we'll have folks from lots of business schools joining us that evening. Evening. So make sure to be a part of these and to join us. Those next two happen to be on the campus in Malibu, so we'll look forward to that. Uh, just a couple of other things I want to mention. You know, we talk a lot about developing value-centered leaders and advancing responsible business practice. We had two events very recently that are sort of uh, in a very distinct way illustrate that. Uh, one, we had about a week ago a, our value-centered leadership lab, which is a student-run organization off of the Malibu campus, did, had a case competition. And so we had student groups from all of our campus participate. And that was a wonderful event where they actually get a really complex case that has business issues, has social issues or environmental issues, and they have to figure out 
how to resolve that and come to terms with the best response and issue. And I think the students always find that it's a whole lot more complicated than it might seem in trying to balance all of those things. And then related to that, we also just hosted our uh, SEER Symposium and Entrepreneur's Journey. We blended those together this year. SEER is our socially, environmentally, and ethically responsible uh, business strategy program and certificate. Had some fabulous speakers there. We had uh, Charlie Ayers, who's the founding executive chef of Google, telling us how to eat healthy and cook healthy. Uh, Roger Eaton, he's the chief operating officer of Yum Brands. Now, that tied with the Google guy, Yum does KFC and Pizza Hut. Uh, but he talked about the things they're doing to try to be socially responsible around the world, a huge global company that it probably went global as early as any of the fast food organizations did. And then we also had Sally McCoy there, who's the CEO of Camelback that does the bottles, water bottles. So a really diverse group of people. It was a fabulous day. We had about 150 to 200 people on the Malibu campus. Some really exciting things going on in that space uh, in our programs. Um, some things are coming up that you need to pay attention to, and we'd love to have you attend in addition to our Dean's Executive Leadership Series. Um, in December, all three of our uh, Grad CDO Alumni Network chapters, the Los Angeles chapter, the Orange County chapter, and our Northern California chapter, which probably won't affect too many of you, are hosting holiday events. And all of those events have a volunteer give back component to them. So look on our website for the appropriate location and a group for you, depending on where you live or work. We'd love to have you be a part of that as we give back and try to help the community during the holiday season. And then on December 4th, uh, we are hosting, we have a small business breakfast series, and we have one at Santa Monica College on December 4th, uh, where you will hear from one of our alumni about a new trends in mobile and online marketing. So uh, lots of things coming up before the holidays that we hope that you'll take advantage of. And then the last thing that I want to mention, you also have another piece of paper in your seat. And this is really this month, uh, we, we, one of the reasons we're able to do the kinds of things that we do like this Dean's Executive Leadership Series is because so many of you support our work, support us financially, as well as supporting us by coming. We have a lot of our executive associates in the room. Would you guys all stand up? You have a red tag on. I want you to stand up. Let's recognize these, these folks are helping support the school financially as executive associates. They're wonderful. They help us. In, I can look around this room and see these people. They come to everything. They support and volunteer for things. So let's give them a hand for being a part of this. But we, so we would encourage you to think about being an executive associate, but also this tells you a little bit about our matching gift program. There are many companies that, that you work for that actually have a matching gift program. Disney is a company like that. So that if you give a gift to a charitable organization, they will match that gift in some form or fashion. So we hope that you'll think about that, particularly here at the end of the year in the holiday season. Cynthia Ware is at the back, and she can answer any questions that you have about that um, if you have questions this evening. So it's a pleasure to be here. There's so much going on that we're very, very excited about that we hope you'll take advantage of. Uh, but the main reason we're here is to hear from our speaker tonight. Uh, we are just thrilled to have Jana Winogray joining us tonight, or I guess we're sort of joining Jana since we're on her, in her property. Uh, Jana uh, has been with uh, kind of ABC since 1994, but she currently, since 2009, has served as Executive Vice President for Business Affairs and Administration for the ABC Entertainment Group. So basically that means she does all the deals and the agreements and general business-related kinds of development things for all of their primetime and late night programming, uh, marketing, and ABC.com. She also does it for ABC Daytime and SoapNet. Broad responsibilities in terms of making things work kind of behind the scenes uh, with ABC. Uh, she is a Californian. She went to uh, UC San Diego, and then she went to the Bolt School of Law at Cal Berkeley. Uh, so we are thrilled to have Jana with us. She's going to share some with us, and then she and I will come up here to the front at the end so we can have a conversation and engage you in a discussion with Jana as well. So Jana, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Thank you guys for coming, and thank you to Dean Livingstone. Um, I really appreciate the introduction, and I appreciate being here, and in fact, before I came, knowing that I was going to meet Dean Livingstone, I was reading up on the internet about um, female deans of business schools, 
And a couple of articles I came upon were talking about how much more likely it is for a business school who has a female dean to be engaged in courses about ethics and values. And so it was really interesting to hear you speak about that, and I think it's an amazing thing. Because one of the things that Dean Livingstone and I were talking about um, when I did my podcast before I came up here was the importance of a strong ethical core and integrity. And that's not just when you work for a Fortune 500 company. I think it's when you work for any company. And I think it is probably one of the most important qualities that you, you look for in somebody at a higher level in any company or at any level. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a little story. Before, when I first found out that I was speaking here, I tried to think about what to talk about, and I sat down and I wrote a speech. And <laughs> I wrote actually what I thought was a pretty good speech. And it was all about change, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, and the sort of ins and outs of my career and how they've coincided with the evolution of television. And I gave my speech, my practice speech, a couple of times to a few people, and then I asked my husband if he would listen to my speech. And as any busy, busy executive, I drove with my husband to take the kids to school so he could listen to it while we drove home. <laughs> um, so just to be clear, I didn't drive. But while we drove back from dropping our kids off at school at 7.45 in the morning, I gave him my speech. And my husband, who is generally supportive to a fault, was just silent. I was like, I'm so confused. I thought this was a good speech. And he said, you know what? It is a really good speech, and the information's really interesting, but it's so not you. You know, the people that are coming to see you want to see who Jana Winograd is. They don't want to see who this idea is of somebody giving a corporate speech of Jana Winograd. So I ripped it up. First, let's be clear. <laughs> let's be clear, I got a little huffy. <laughs> I was a little wetted to my speech, and I walked away. But when I thought about it, I realized that he was right. You know, at the end of the day, you, you can't speak to people and be an authentic person unless you're saying your own words and you're speaking about things that you believe in and you're talking to people about things that they want to hear. So I did throw away the speech, but I did, you know, have a few things I wanted to talk to you tonight, so let me tell you what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about it, and then we'll have some questions and answers. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am, and then I'm going to talk about mentorship, because I think mentorship's really important, and I think no matter where you are in your career, either as a mentee or a mentor, and I just have to say I'm lucky enough to have Elizabeth Boykevich here, who is my current <laughs> mentee in a Walt Disney program, um, it's a really important thing, and I'm going to talk about balance. Because I have to say, one of the things I get asked about the most when I'm talking to a group of people is how you balance life and work. And then I'm going to talk about change, which is what I initially wrote my speech about. Um, not just because I wrote it, but because I think it's important. <laughs> so who am I? Um, as Dean Livingstone said, I grew up in California. I went to UC San Diego, and then I went to UC Berkeley, Bolt Hall School of Law. I'm a product of the UC system, a big believer in it. And when I graduated from law school at the time, and I don't know if it's the same now, it was really a funnel to big law firms. They really felt like the thing that you know, they were preparing people to do was go be you know, a corporate lawyer in a big law firm. And I did that. And I went to work for a firm called Munger, Tolson and Olson downtown. And it was an incredible experience. People were very smart. But as I looked around, it really wasn't for me. And when I looked, I couldn't see myself being there 20 years from now as a happy and fulfilled person. So I looked around. I tried to think about what I wanted to do. And actually, ABC was a client of Munger, Tolson, Olson at the time. So I was familiar with some of the legal issues that were raised by the entertainment business. And when a job came up at ABC, I was lucky enough to apply and get it. And that job was in litigation and employment advice. And one of the things I had been thinking about getting away from was litigation, because I really wanted to be part of helping to address problems before they happened, as opposed to dealing with solving them after the fact. I found litigation very contentious, and I really wanted to be a facilitator, not somebody who was dealing with the mess afterwards. But I thought it was a good chance to get my foot in the door. And in fact, it was. Um, so I started 
and I did litigation employment for approximately a year and an opportunity came up in what was then our in-house production company to do legal and business affairs. And even though I had never done it, I figured if I can talk them into letting me do it, I'm going to. <laughs> and they did. And I did that for about a year and a half and then the man who was at that time the head of network business affairs at ABC asked me if I wanted to go over there and be a director of business affairs at the network. Just to explain a little bit, I think most of you probably know this, but the way television works is you have the networks, which used to be the broadcast networks, and over time turned into the broadcast and cable networks, and they are the distributors of programs, and then you have the studios or the production companies, and they make shows and sell them to the networks. So this, although I had been working at our in-house production company, this was a job going to work for the network. And it was no longer going to be in legal. This was going to be a business job. And I'd never had a business job, and I was trying to decide if I should take the job, and I called the man who had hired me, who was Alan Braverman, who at the time, this was still Cap City's ABC before the Disney merger, he was the general counsel of ABC. And I said to him, you know, I'm trying to think about whether I should do this, what do you think? And he said, I don't think you should do it. I think, and by the way, this is one of the smartest men you will ever meet in your entire life. Um, he said, I don't think you should do it because the truth is that those are boring licensing jobs. The rules haven't changed in 25 years. It's going to be a rote job and you are going to be bored to tears. And the truth is that if the world hadn't changed so much, by the way, clearly I did not take his advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I went. But um, if the world hadn't changed so much in the next 16 years, he would have been right. And in fact, what he said to me at the time was good advice based on where he was sitting and what the business was. But the truth is that, and I'm going to talk about this later, so I'm not going to get into it too much now, but the business changed so much over those 16 years that there were many times I walked into my boss's office and I was like, I was promised a boring job. I want my boring job. Because <laughs> there was never a dull moment. We literally spent 16 years changing the television industry and changing everything we did from a business perspective. Um, what I do now, I've actually worked my way up in the network business affairs department. Business affairs is the group at its most base which makes deals. So on the network side, that's making the deals to acquire programming from outside studios, basically licensing deals because the network's licensing certain rights from the production company. And business fairs on the studio side is actually the production of television. So they're very different jobs. On the studio side, you're hiring the writers, the directors, you're acquiring rights. You're doing everything necessary to make a show. And on the network side, you're buying a show. And so I was doing mostly network business fairs. And when we merged with the Walt Disney Company, I started doing some studio business fairs as well. But for most of my career, I was predominantly a network business affairs executive. And I worked my way up, and I was very lucky because I worked for a man by the name of Mark Petowitz, who ran network business affairs and over time became actually the president of our studio, ABC Studios. Um, but he was an amazing man, and he was an amazing mentor. And when I talk about mentors in a little while, I'm going to talk a lot about Mark Petowitz because he was an incredible example of somebody who took somebody into a company and then not only trained them, but he truly looked and said, I think one day you will have my job. And then did everything he could to sort of train me to have that job. And when he left, I got his job. And two years ago, we actually merged our network and our studio back together. And when they did that, I also took over the studio business affairs and I have a music department. And then in addition to that, <laughs> I would say I serve as the general business consigliere to Paul Lee, who's the president of our network. I manage our programming and development budgets, um, take, take a very big role in creating our five-year plan and our strategy decks, and then in managing to those decks on an annual basis to our annual operating plan. And over time, I've really stepped much more into a business role. While I oversee a lot of the deal making, I don't get as involved on a day-to-day -day basis because there's somebody who runs network business affairs or somebody who runs studio business affairs or somebody who runs our music department and they all report up to me. So that's what I do. So how did I get here? Um, 
Mentorship is a really interesting topic because it means such different things to different people. And at the Walt Disney Company, we have structured mentorship programs, hence Elizabeth being here. And when I was, it was about 15 years ago, I was actually a mentee in that program and Bob Iger was my mentor. And this was before, this was right after the Disney merger. And he was still based in New York and I would fly to New York once a month and sit down with Bob and he would take me to his meetings and take me to his lunches and it was an unbelievable experience. It's hard to even put into words. That's the kind of structured mentor program. It's hard, you know, you can't say anything bad about that. And over time, that used to be just for women and for people of color trying to help, you know, groom the people that they wanted to see at the upper levels of the company that they felt were underrepresented. Over the past five or six years, they've expanded it. And now it's everybody, so everybody can take advantage. And I then moved over time from being a mentee to a mentor. And for the past six years, I've had a number of mentors from all, a number of mentees from all over the company. And the interesting thing about structured mentorships is you're assigned to a person. And sometimes that works out great because, as with Elizabeth, sometimes you can really connect to a person. You can give somebody great advice and you can, you know, be helpful. And the truth is sometimes when you're attached to a stranger, it doesn't work quite as well because you just, don't connect. So as much as I love these programs and I think they're amazing, I really feel like it's equally or more important that you find a mentor in your given area that knows you, you know, that knows who you are, that supports who you are, that's gonna be there for you and identify you as a person that they believe in. Because I don't think that I would be where I am today if I hadn't had somebody like that. And those people change over time. You know, I was really lucky to have one person for 10 years, but they've changed over time. Paul Lee, who's the president of our network now, and Ann Sweeney, who's the chairman of the Media Networks Group, both of them have been incredible mentors to me over the later part of my career. You know, people who will say, you know, this is what I see, this is how I think you can grow. And I cannot express enough the importance of trying to find those people in your life and to nurture those relationships. And while I think mentors are important, I think role models are important too. And they're very different. You know, a role model you don't have to know. They don't have to be part of your career. One of the reasons I left a law firm was that when I looked around, I didn't see a role model for myself. I didn't see a woman who had a family that was also a successful partner in a law firm. And honestly, I didn't actually see a lot of men who seemed happy. You know, to me, part of being a role model is not just what you're doing, but are you happy? Does this seem like a fulfilling career? Can I see myself 20 years from now doing this and enjoying it? And I didn't see that there. And so for me, that was part of the reason I left. And when I came to ABC, I found role models everywhere. And not just for balance, but role models for finding a career where people are so passionate about what they do and they enjoy it, and they go to work loving it. You know, Ann Sweeney worked her way up to chairman of the Media Network. She has two children, one of whom is special needs. There's a woman, Janice Marinelli, who's the president of our media distribution group, and distribution by its nature is a very male intensive. It's sales, it's going market to market, selling, you know, in markets that are less accepting of not white males. Um, and she, you know, barreled through that, she's a little bit older than me, so at a time when it wasn't as accepted while raising three kids. Those are role models. And I, again, I can't, you know, emphasize enough the importance of identifying those people if you can and, you know, making sure that whatever you choose to do, you have someone, I, I, and I'm not saying you can't do it if no one's ever done it, I'm just saying it's a lot harder to walk down a road you have to pave yourself than it is to walk down a road somebody else has paved for you. Um, so let's talk a little about balance. And when I say balance, I think it's important, I mean there are a lot of men in this audience, to not just talk about women with families, because that's not all it is. I mean, you don't have to have kids to want to have a life. And I think you can't be a good executive at whatever you're doing unless you have other interests other than what you're doing at work. For me, 
to be honest, it's about being a mother with kids. And so I'm gonna talk about that experience because that's my experience, but I do think it's important to say that that's not all it is. And I'm gonna be the first to tell you, it's not easy. And I think anybody who has kids and has a high level job and tells you it's easy is either superwoman or in total denial. <laughs> because, I, you know, it can't be easy. The truth of the matter is, that if both things are a full-time job. There's a reason women don't work outside the home, and it's because it's a full-time job. And to me, I found that it comes down to two things, choices and boundaries. Um, choices in that we all have to remember that, you know, I'm obviously speaking very self-aware that I'm a highly educated person who got a job in a good economy. So I'm talking about choices in the context of that. There are gonna be times everybody has to take a job because we all have to you know, pay our bills and work. But to the extent that you have the choice to go to a company where you can get home at night or to be in a place where you know that people are gonna be supportive if your child's sick and you have to go home, those are choices. And again, when I was in a law firm, I didn't see that. And so I actually made a very conscious choice. And the first year I came to ABC, I made far less than I made in a law firm, and it wasn't until I had been here for six to seven years that I even made the same amount that I worked at a law firm. But to me, I felt like that was a choice I was willing to make, because even though I wasn't married at the time and I didn't have kids, I knew that for me that was going to be really important, and so it was a choice I made. I actually was lucky enough to sit, I'm part of a group of women who, and a really esteemed group of women, everybody from, you know, there's an ambassador and, and a television producer, and I've been really lucky to be invited to have dinner with these women. Um, it's really a support group of sorts, but we call it dinner. And, um, <laughs> and at this dinner last month, they invited a group of girls from an organization called Step Up. And Step Up is an organization which helps youth that are at high risk and to get themselves through high school and hopefully get to college. And they had invited a number of girls that had made it to college to come to this dinner. It was amazing. And seated next to me was a woman by the name of Judy, Judy Olian, who happens to be the dean of the UCLA School of Business. So less than 20% of deans in business schools in the US happen to be women. I've met two of them in the last month. <laughs> <laughs> But as we were all going around the room and telling our stories to these girls and giving our piece of advice, I have to say, she said something that was so amazing and that I had never heard before, but to me rang really true. So I'm gonna share it with you. And what she said was she gives advice all day long to women and men who are going out in the business world. And what she says to them is that they're gonna have a million choices to make. They're gonna have you know, choices about where they're gonna work and how they're gonna do it and all of those things. But that the most important choice that people will make in their career is their choice of a partner. And I had never heard it put that way. And I have to say, at least for me, it rang really true because you know, so much of what we decide to do and the steps we decide to take and how much we're willing to do for our career and whether is how much support you get from the person sitting next to you, whoever that may be. So I thought I'd share that with you. Um, one more point about choice and boundaries and balance is technology. You know, technology is an amazing thing. And over the course of my career, it has completely changed how we do our jobs. And I have to say, for me, I don't know what I would do without it because it gives you an incredible amount of flexibility to be able to be present while not being present. But it's a real double-edged sword because, you know, one, the world moves so much faster than it ever did before. It used to be you call someone at 6.30, you get their voicemail, and you call them back the next day, and then somebody tells you something. You call. Now, if things aren't happening within three minutes, people wonder where you are, you know? <laughs> it's like, why haven't you responded? What happened? Um, and, and that can be really tough, especially because if you're at, at work all day and then you go home and you're happy to have this thing because it allows you to leave, but at the same time, if you're going to be present, you want to be present. And that's, a real, that's also a really tough balance, and I think it's an equally tough balance for men and women to not be sitting there, you know, whenever they're not at work like this. 
there was, there's a man I work really closely with and he would email all weekend. He runs a fairly big department and he would email all weekend to people. And he had no awareness that when he emails, people felt like they needed to respond. You know, he's the boss. And so in the course of one of these feedback, one of these 360 feedbacks that we senior executives go through, he got the feedback that people were really concerned that they were expected to email all weekend. And he was shocked because to him, he thought his thoughts, he put them in an email, and he didn't expect people to work all weekend, um, so he changed his practice. And now what he does is he writes his emails all weekend, and he saves them. And on Monday morning, he sends them out. And it, it, and it was incredible, because just that little piece of feedback really changed how he worked and how he did things. And it, it's an important thing for everybody to remember at every level about the burdens and the great things of technology. So let's talk a little bit about change. Um, this is what I was originally going to give my speech about because it's, I really believe that especially in today's day and age that you cannot be an executive without having an incredible amount of adaptability. You know, when uh, the, the speed at which things change is so unbelievable. And it's not just technology, you know, it's the way we do our business practices, it's everything. You, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, nothing certain but death and taxes, and I decided that it was gonna be nothing is certain but death, taxes, and that right when you get used to something, it will change. <laughs> and I think people find it really scary, but in fact it can be incredibly, incre it, it's an incredible catalyst for innovation and for change. And as I referenced before, when I came to ABC, one of my, you know, the advice I was given was that nothing was going to change. And it is just, it's phenomenal, the change in the television business over the last 15 years. I don't know how many people here actually remember when television was ABC, CBS, and NBC. Anybody? Uh, <laughs> but not that many people. And that's how it was for the first 35 years of television. You know, then Fox came along, and then the WB, which turned into the CW, and then a little bit later the cable channels came, and then they started proliferating, and then it went from, you know, having one screen in your house where everybody had to make an appointment to watch television at a particular time if they wanted to watch their shows, to VHS, and then DVD, and then DVRs, which we all call TiVo, and then AVOD, and then subscription VOD. We can't even keep track of the acronyms anymore. <laughs> I mean, we really can't keep track of the acronyms anymore. And all of a sudden, we were sitting in our offices, and we were trying to figure out and talk about all day long things that we hadn't even conceptualized a few years before. And it was interesting in TV because, you know, all of our rights agreements were based on being a broadcast network. Things as you know, simple as in a broadcast network agreement, you have to define what a network broadcast means because when you're getting rights from a studio, you have to define what it means to take a network broadcast. Well, what did that mean? All of a sudden, we had people saying to us, well, if we want to deliver this over the internet, can we do it? I'm like, well, sounds like you need a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and, we would <laughs> and we would look at our agreements, and in fact, network broadcast didn't contemplate delivering over the internet. And that is the smallest example of how everything changed for us. You know, we went from a world where, when there were only three networks, there was a group of legislation in place, it was called the Financial Syndication Rules. It was in the 1970s. And it was meant to make sure that the broadcast networks didn't have too much power. Because when you think about it, when there's only three networks that are governing the entire airways, the thought was, you know, that's an incredible amount of power to get to a publicly licensed entity. And so they had this whole slew of legislation that was aimed at making sure that the television networks couldn't get too much power. And a big part of that was that the networks were not allowed to own the television shows that were on their air. And at the same time, they weren't allowed to license anything for more than four years because that was thought to be akin to owning it. And I don't know if anybody remembers, like way back when, 
the ER and Friends negotiations that you would hear about where they renegotiated and they were paying $11 million per episode. All of that was because they had these four-year license terms. And when you have a four-year license term and a huge hit show, come year four, you can pay a lot of money for that television show. <laughs> So in the mid-90s, as it became very clear that the proliferation of cable channels and everything that was going on in the media industry, it made no sense to have these rules anymore because not only was there choice, there was an abundance of choice. And in the mid-90s was when Congress basically abolished these financial syndication rules. And that was right about when I was going to the network. So part of what we have been dealing with, literally for the 16 years I've been there, is how you deal with this, how do you deal with this idea of how long you license a network show for? And the first few years I was there, that was the big thing. You know, can we get these longer terms? And, and over time, it's almost a fad. You know, companies will say, oh, we're only going to license shows for a really long time. And then they say, oh, we're only going to license shows for a really short time. But the one thing that's been constant is that we change our minds all of the time and we're constantly reevaluating. And I truly believe that if I wasn't the type of person who was inspired by and invigorated by that kind of change, it would be impossible to have my job. And I feel that way about the people who work for me, too. The best example I can think of of a really you know, innovative thing that I did in my career was we, I was part of the team that made the initial deal with Apple in 2005 to put ABC content onto the video and Disney content onto the video iPod. At the time, nobody knew what a video iPod was. Nobody had ever distributed content in that way. And two of us, me and my boss, Mark Padowitz, and one lawyer from the Disney company got in a room with one executive and one lawyer from Apple. And there was a big non-disclosure in, pla in place. So you couldn't even go and try and get information from other people to find out how a deal like this might be structured. And we sat in a room for two days and we hammered out this deal. And we sort of made it up as we went along. But my theory always is if you get a lot of really smart people in a room and they know what they're talking about, you can kind of figure it out. And we figured it out. And we actually negotiated what was you know, the first deal of its type to signature in that room over two days. And when we walked out, it was amazing because we knew we had done something pretty historic. We knew we had completely changed the way television would be distributed, but sort of protected the model of TV distribution at the same time. And that's one example, but I could sit here for four hours and give you a million. What I really wanted to talk about too, though, was creative. Because, you know, we always say nobody wants to watch a business model. And what we mean by that is we can come up with the best deal in the world and we can come up with a million different ways to, you know, buy a TV show for less than you want to pay for it. But if nobody wants to watch it, it's pointless. And what people want to watch has really changed over time. And that's just another way that we've had to adapt our business. You know, the increased sophistication of television, if you go back and you look at a show, even from the beginning of the 90s or the late 90s to now, is just completely different. We like to say that it started with Desperate Lost and Grays in 2004. Um, and I think it really did. But the, the number of scenes in a show, the number of actors in a show, the way the storytelling works, the amount of visual effects has all completely changed. And as you change things like that, not only does it increase costs for the exact elements, but you have to sort of build worlds around them. So if you now have you know, 20 scenes instead of 10 scenes, you have to populate those scenes, you have to dress the actors, you have to build the sets, and the cost just starts to you know, exponentially increase. And as we have all of this increased fragmentation in television, we were in this weird place where what was being demanded of the consumer was getting more and more sophisticated, but our business models were getting more and more challenged because our costs were rising, but our ratings were going down. Um, and so one of the ways that we've been able to manage this process has been through technology. You know, we have things like green screen and virtual set extensions and CG effects, which allow us now to produce in a way we could never produce before. And the best example of that is Once Upon a Time. I don't know if anybody in this room has seen it, but there are basically two worlds. You have the real world, where 
you know, it's in real time, in real, you know, today's day and age. And then you have this entire fantasy world that's being created, and it's the fantasy world of fairy tales. And somebody wrote this on the page, and our executives looked at it, and they were like, this is amazing. We can't produce this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because not only would it be so expensive, but nobody could really imagine how you could produce it in a time frame where you could produce 22 to 24 episodes a season, and that's what we have to do. So through the magic of movie making, what they came up with is all of the actors actually stand in front of a green screen. And they do their acting in front of a green screen, and then they digitally master the world in behind them. And I brought a little something to show you how it works. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, we had another example like that. I don't know if anybody watches Grey's Anatomy, but a few years ago we had a ferry episode where a big ferry sunk in the Seattle Harbor. And we got a call from the Coast Guard saying that they had seen the episode and they couldn't figure out how we had made this thing happen <laughs> without them being made aware of it. <laughs> and we had to explain to them that the whole thing was digital effects and that none of that had actually happened. Um, so I told you everything was going to change, but there is one constant in the entertainment industry, and that is the need for good storytelling. Because no matter how we deliver it and no matter how we produce it, the one thing that remains constant is that people want to see a good story. So I thought I'd wrap up by showing you some of, you know, clips of our best stories of the year. So before I wrap up, I thought I'd give you an idea of how hard it is to actually end up in that clip reel. Every year we have a development cycle, and it really is an annual cycle where we have a certain time of the year where we take all of the pitches, and then we have a certain time of year where all the writers are off writing, we get our scripts in, we order our pilots, our pilots then go through, get picked up to series, we go through the upfronts, we start all over again. Every year we buy 120 to 150 scripts, half drama, half comedy. Of those, we make 20 to 24 pilots. Of those, we pick up six to seven series a year. And of those, 85% of them fail. So it's a, it's a crazy business, and to end up on that reel is a true accomplishment and a lot of work and a lot of passion by a lot of people. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs>